22 års Engelsbergs seminarium har precis avslutats. Temat i år har varit frihet, liberty. Och i det pass som nu följer diskuteras NATOs betydelse för att värna friheten och Finlands och Sveriges väg in i gemenskapen. The parties of this treaty are determined to safeguard the freedom common heritage and civilization of their peoples, founded on the principles of democracy, individual liberty and the rule of law. That's NATO. Let's take a close glance at NATO in reality, starting with Charlie Salunius Pasnak. All right. Um, now, I spoke here in 2015 about war may return to this part of the world. Um, a year later, I started my talk uh, on geopolitics with a joke about Spikeman, Mahan, and Dugan. Um, now, I love dark humor, but I have gotten much more solace uh, this year from yesterday's and today's talks about liberty, um, about the freedom to do something or the freedom from something, uh, freedom to do your own thing, as it were. And this is fundamentally the reason I think Finland, in the end, sought to seek NATO membership. A desire to maintain for future generations a freedom from and strengthen security against those that would seek to restrict the liberty of Finns. Now, listening yesterday to Mark Shivsky, I was sure that modern day Finns could appreciate the simple list of uh, Athenian freedoms. Not living under ty tyranny, yes. Participation in society, you can largely live as you like and not being a slave in the sense that a economic or social background doesn't uh, determine your future outcome or limit your potential. Now, Alexander Lee added to this, um, talking about Venice and the idea that you can make people better through education, more virtuous, um, and the idea that art could then be used to suggest that maybe there's a greater good to consider. Now, in Finland, education is held in high esteem. This is good to make better citizens, but also because in the end, those citizens will feel there's a reason for Finland to exist. I will return to this. Um, but simply note that Mark and then also later Chris Coker spoke about Athens in a way that made it clear that despite hearing, I don't know how many times in the last three, four months about Finland being the Sparta of the North, Athens is in fact a much better um, historical metaphor. Why? Because it was quite clear that the Athenians realized that freedom required collective sacrifices, and therefore liberties must be balanced. So without collective action, such as military action or military service, which obviously limits personal freedom, there can ultimately be no personal freedom. Now, it took the Finns and Swedes a couple decades to decide on NATO membership after EU membership. Um, the opinion in Finland has been against NATO membership um, remarkably, it's been remarkably stable. 60 to 70 percent have been against it and 20 to 30 percent for it since the late 90s, um, irrespective of what was happening around the world. Why? Well, there's a number of reasons, but I'll give you a few historical kind of signposts maybe. One starts with a frequently used quote. Every country has quotes that are used and misused for historical purposes. Um, but the King's Gate, swimming in a fortress right outside of Helsinki. It says, stand here on your own two feet and do not expect or trust foreign assistance. Now, considering the fact that prior to the building of this fortress and after, Russia had attacked the Finnish people, depending on how you count, 30 to 40 times, and Usually the Finns have been left to their own devices to fend for themselves. This was a fairly reasonable reminder, I think. Now, this idea of being left alone was strengthened during the Winter War against the Soviet Union. Um, it's a little bit of a myth, of course, because Sweden graciously donated, for instance, about a third of its air force, uh, let about seven, 8,000 volunteers come and fight on the Finnish side. But it is a national myth. Uh, second one, a historical lesson, 
is there's a sense that Finland has been drawn into wars by the West, while a part of the Swedish Empire, and forced into wars by the East, Russia. And therefore, the historical lesson, avoid getting into or being a piece of great power competitions. NATO is still viewed by quite a number of people as a tool of great power competition. As a side note to those who like IR theory, there's an idea of entanglement. In Finland, that is, large countries being pulled into wars by smaller ones. In Finland, it's the reverse. Finns are deathly afraid that NATO membership will pull them into other wars they could avoid. Now, the Finnish population security view did change after 2014, and then it took another eight years to decide NATO was the right thing. Why? Well, the aforementioned history, a concern of what Russia might do, a belief in our own robust national defense, and increased defense cooperation with Sweden, US, NATO, etc. Um, then, starting at the end of 2021, the population started to look at the world and say, mm, which led to a shift in support for NATO from 25% in early 2022 to nearly 80% in May. That's an incredible shift. Now, as in any demo democracy appropriately, the political parties looked at this and said, ah, oh, we may have some work to do here. Um, now, why did this happen? Research in coming years will actually tell us, but I have some uh, hypotheses. One, Russia's demand for sphere of influence in December 2021. Russia's clear willingness to use actual large-scale military force. Proof that there was difference between being a partner, like Ukraine or Finland, or an ally, in terms of what kind of assistance and how much of it you could expect. Then a change in belief that if Finland kind of made it seem, itself seem unthreatening and had a reasonably functional relationship with Russia, that this would somehow protect it from attack. Uh, the Ukrainians probably also thought this. And then probably a reminder to some who do not get paid to think about this every day of what large-scale mechanized violence and war means to civilians, to soldiers, to cities. Now, there are quickly three other reasons the population changing in mind probably wasn't quite enough. One is a deep pragmatism. Every political leader in Finland said, this is not about party politics. This is about maximizing Finnish security. Second one, we've already had a two decade long de debate about NATO. It's just that the conclusion for 20 years was we don't need NATO. And this time the conclusion was we actually should seek NATO membership. And then finally, I guess something that I've maligned, a NATO option. This was important only because every party in parliament had agreed to the idea that if the security situation changes, Finland can reevaluate and seek NATO membership. Now, um, I thought it was important to say a few words about how the Finnish government motivated, in the end, why Finland needed NATO membership. Foreign Minister Pekka Havisto expressed it, saying Russia's increased propensity to use military force, ability to quickly mass forces at a neighbor's border, and loose talk about nukes, required Finland to have a stronger deterrence, including a nuclear component it could never build by itself and shouldn't, um, and the potential for collective defense efforts. NATO fits the bill. Finnish Defense Minister Antti Kaikkonen, I think, put it even more succinctly. Finnish NATO membership is about avoiding war, deterrence, and failing that to never again have to fight alone. Seems like a fairly reasonable um, reason. Um, now, uh, what kind of member is Finland going to be? Well, I don't think we're going to see a lot of limitations outside of the one imposed by the Constitution, that is, no nukes permanently. Now, I don't think anyone's proposing that Finland gets any nukes, but um, I don't think we're going to see other preset limitations um, in this. Finland and Sweden together will definitely strengthen the transatlantic relationship, and I think their approach will be what I would call Harmelian. That is, yes, focus on strengthening de defense and deterrence, but leave the door open to dialogue for the day Russia, probably under a different regime, may be interested in this. Um, Finland and Sweden will also, unlike most of the recent expansion rounds, provide actual military capabilities, really, really strong ones. And of course, membership, because of geography, will allow NATO, us collectively, 
to replan not just the Baltic Sea or Arctic defense, but all of Northern Europe's defense can be reconceptualized. Um, the big thing for Finland though, and I suspect for Sweden, will be the need to change strategic culture, to go from a very, very strongly held sense of we alone, to belonging to a collective defense family. I've written elsewhere about what all this may mean. This will take some years, but it will happen. Why? Because of Finnish pragmatism and a staunch uh, love for the liberty, for the idea of liberty, both individual and national. I'll end with a historical reflection which may make this clearer than, than any longer analytical treaties. It's October 1939. The winter war is still a month away. In a station from Valilai in Helsinki, uh, there's a train heading towards Kuolamanjärvi, Death Lake. Aboard are about 2,900 soldiers from Jär Yksitoista, um, 11th Infantry Regiment, composed of people from Kallio, Sörnäinen, and Vallila, legendary workers' districts. Now, many were politically left-leaning, with fathers who had fought on the red side of the civil war, a particularly nasty civil war, the scars of which were still two decades later, um, quite fresh in the mind. But nonetheless, even if their fathers had worked, fought for a worker's paradise, what these men abhorred above all else was the idea that someone from the outside, Stalin, would come and tell them how Finnish society should be structured. There was a, they might have fought for each other in the foxholes, yes, but there was a collective sense that it mattered for Finland to survive, for Finland to exist. Progress and safety were um, quite intimately tied together here. That a limitation of personal freedom in form of national military service was necessary to ensure national liberty because there needed to be a Finland so there could be a Finnish political system that was free to make decisions about how society was structured, about having high quality free education from um, daycare all the way through university, about having a good functioning healthcare system, all of these things. All the things that ultimately liberate the individual and allows them to flourish, irrespective of their social background. This required a free Finland, and therefore, it was worth for these men to sacrifice personal liberty or life to ensure collective liberty. Thank you. How does Finland view its fellow candidate Sweden? We've done it together, but there are certain differences, I think. Um, yes, there are some differences, and I think part don't of... Be too, don't be too polite, because you, just because you're in Sweden. Um, well, part of it is driven how the Finnish population changed its mind, forcing the hand of the Finnish politicians, including the president, I may add, which then forced the hand of the Swedes. Um, this led to some scheduling differences, but I would say there's a political culture difference in that the Finnish foreign ministry ministers were charged with going through every NATO member country and saying, green light, red light, what, what is this? And countries such as Turkey told the Finnish president and foreign minister, absolutely green light for Finland. We'd love for you to come in. So it was a little bit of a surprise to us when that wasn't the case. Um, I think, I mean, politicians have for years talked about the importance of Finland and Sweden going in together. And I think it's symbolically important that that happens. But Finland has prepared itself for much longer time than Sweden, where we had no NATO debate until February 2022. Well, this probably has to do with the fact that security, as I was describing, um, is a pragmatic question usually in, in Finland. Uh, not belonging to a NATO or military alliance it was a question of looking at the positives and negatives. And until six months ago, there were more negatives as opposed to my understanding of, of Sweden, at least some Swedish parties, is that this was much more ideological. And as everyone here knows, if you have to change part of your identity versus just making a pragmatic choice, um, one is easier than the other. Mm -hmm. The experiences of war is different? Yes, we've had them.
Okay, Sweden has had them yeah, too. Yeah. Um, as the Russians uh, no doubt you remind me. You don't on my have Twitter to tell program. me that you've had them, but what does this mean, do you think, to prepare public opinion? I mean, many uh, Finns remember, or remember, their parents remember the war, the sacrifices. Yes, it, it, it is a natural thing to do, um, to prepare for things. I've been asked, do the Finns prepare for World War III continuously? And I say, no. The societal preparations you take, whether or not it is civilian shelters or any number of other things, they help society to be more resilient, whether or not it's an industrial accident, nuclear accident, fall storm, all these things. Um, that, I think, um, is the key to understanding Finnish preparations. Having looked at how Finns responded to Ukraine, it is clear that the collective kind of near-mythical history I mentioned is there. There's a sense that I may be a 25-year-old Finn, but in my family, there are people who can more closely identify with what Ukrainian civilians are going mm -hmm. through, for instance. Soon you will be back here. Thank you this Thank far. Thank you. Mary Sarot, how will NATO Scandinavia change when Denmark and Norway add Sweden and Finland and possibly Sweden, we should say? Great. Well, thank you very much. As the only member of my panel not fluent in Swedish, I had to rely on Google Translate. <laughs> but I am very grateful to our host today for letting me uh, come to, on my first trip to Sweden. All right, so let me just talk a little bit about the history of NATO expansion. It's a topic of my own personal interest. My interest in this grows out of a, a personal background. I was an exchange student studying abroad in West Berlin in 1989. And so everything that I've done afterwards has in some way been colored by that experience. I decided to become a historian to try to figure out the origins of what I saw on that day. And I have ended up writing a trilogy of books. I did not realize at the beginning that they would be a trilogy, and each book stands on its own, but they are related. I've written a book called The Collapse, The Accidental Opening of the Berlin Wall, and then another book about the foreign policy of German unification called 1989, The Struggle to Create Post-Cold War Europe. And as part of the research for that book, I came across early d documents from the history of NATO expansion already in 1990. I published an article related to this, and it got so much attention that I decided to publish a book on the topic, which is called Not One Inch, America, Russia, and the Making of Post-Cold War Stalemate. And I was rather pleased to see when I walked in that the foundation had generously purchased two of these doorstoppers, presumably as a cure for insomnia among conference participants. <laughs> so it is highly effective. It is out there. If you can't sleep, you know what to do. So uh, these books are based on uh, historical research and interviews. I um, went and did research in France, Germany, Poland, Russia, the UK, and the US. This was all paid for by OPM, other people's money. That's the best way to get your research paid for. And I also did, uh, for each book, uh, close to 100 interviews. Some of them overlapped. So it's based on not only documents, many of which I got declassified, but also interviews, private papers, sound, and video recordings. In particular, one of my biggest declassification breakthroughs was with the Clinton Library. I spent three years trying to get what I refer to as the Bill Boris bromance in print. In other words, all of the transcripts, briefing books, after action reports, and scuttlebutt from all of the Bill Clinton Boris Yeltsin summits. There were 18 of them. Initially, my requests failed, so I had to go through a three-year appeal process, and I was somewhat amazed when it eventually succeeded. If you're interested in this, I've put some of the more interesting excerpts, excerpts on the line at the National Security Archive website. This is the starting page, so you can look that up if this is of interest to you. Uh, um, among my many declassifications, which I've done in six countries, this one was unique because the Kremlin complained. This is a copy of the TASS news release, TASS being the, still the Russian ag news agency following on the Soviet news agency. And when the Clinton Library declassified the records on the basis of my appeal, Clinton, uh, the, uh, sorry, the Kremlin spokesman, Dmitry Peskov, said that was not right, that was not appropriate, because the documents on uh, Yeltsin in particular from the late 1990s included quite a bit about Putin and how Putin became uh, the heir to Yeltsin. Yeltsin discusses that quite openly, surprisingly openly with Clinton. 
from about uh, late 97 on, he's looking for a successor, he's old, he's ill, he wants to exit, and he's auditioning a bunch of people. Uh, ab above all, he really wanted Victor Chernomyrdin. Interesting idea to think how different history would be today if he had succeeded in his plan of making Victor Chernomyrdin his successor. But finally he gets to Putin and he tells Clinton that this is it, he's it, you've gotta meet him, Putin's the guy. So the Peskov complained about this, said this should not have been released, and of course that meant that I knew I'd really gotten the good stuff. And I was not disappointed. So the book, as you can see, is really a doorstopper. It's 600 pages. Uh, there's a lot more in it than I can talk about in the allotted 15 minutes. So I just wanna focus on uh, what I call the Scandinavian strategy, given where we are today. This is a map of Vladimir Putin's childhood, also my, my childhood. I realize it's a little hard to see the fine print in the back. The only thing you really want to pay attention to here is that this green color shows you what were Cold War NATO countries, and this orange color shows you what were Cold War Warsaw Pact countries. The Warsaw Pact was, of course, the involuntary alliance forced by the Soviet Union on Central and Eastern Europeans. And you can see here that the front line runs uh, fairly far westward and indeed be between the two halves of Germany. This is West Germany and East Germany. Again, I know it's a little hard to read the names in the back. So this is the Cold War line. Vladimir Putin, of course, is a loyal servant of the Soviet state. Uh, he grows up in uh, Lenin, what is in Leningrad with stories of the heroism, Soviet heroism in World War II. He sees heroic movies about being a secret agent. He decides to join the KGB or secret police, and he is actually positioned in East Germany in Dresden, not all that far from where I actually was as an exchange student, although of course I didn't know him since I was inside West Berlin. But the important point is that he witnesses with his own eyes the collapse of this world order, the collapse of the Soviet Union. And as many of you know, he has repeatedly described the collapse of the Soviet Union as the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. Now, think about that for a minute. There is a lot of competition for that title. <laughs> And his answer is collapse of the Soviet Union. He is also not happy about what follows. This is one of the maps from the book. This shows NATO as it was in 2020 with 30 countries. Again, I realize it's hard to see the tiny print, but basically anything that is white is a NATO country and anything that is in this light gray color is not a NATO country. And so Vladimir Putin is very, very unhappy about this map. You can obviously see how much farther the line goes. And in particular, it is much closer to his hometown of St. Petersburg than when he was a young man. Now, what do I mean by Scandinavian strategy? Well, as NATO formed itself, the one, Norway was one of the original members, but Norway was unique. It was the only original member to have a land border with the Soviet Union. And so Norway realized that its membership was qualitatively different than that of other countries. It realized, as I talk about in my book, Not One Inch, that the cost per inch of NATO enlargement goes up the closer you get to the border with the Soviet Union or to Russia. And so Norway did something that I think was very smart, uh, I don't just say that because I know there are a lot of Norwegians in the room <laughs> and one on the panel, uh, but Norway decided to restrain itself. So it became a full member. It enjoys the full Article 5 guarantee. Article 5 is the heart of the NATO treaty. It's the article that states any member state will treat an attack on one as an attack on all. So it has the full Article 5 guarantee, but it's imposed conditions. So no foreign troops on its soil in peacetime, no nuclear weapons on its lands or in its ports. And the reason Norway did that voluntarily, that was not imposed on it by other allies, was to keep long-term frictions with the Soviet Union manageable. Norway realized that it lived in a neighborhood that was Soviet adjacent, but not Soviet controlled, and decided to take steps to both become a member and manage long-term frictions. And that is, I think, a very relevant example for today, because of course now we're talking about the Baltics, Finland, Sweden, all of which are now living in a neighborhood that is Russia adjacent, but not Russia controlled. And so this historical challenge, which was old, is now new again as we are talking about the future of this region. And here's a close-up in particular showing Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, the Baltics, uh, in the context of uh, Sweden and Finland. These are, of course, not yet NATO members. I do not think the Turkish objections will prevent Finland and Sweden from becoming members. I think it will happen. So I'm working on that assumption, and I'll talk about Finland. I'm talking about Finland and Sweden on the assumption they are going to be NATO members. Problem right now, of course, is this little part of Russia that is non-contiguous with the rest of the territory. 
And for this reason, I think it's very fortunate that uh, Finland and Sweden want to join, because at the moment, this is a very big challenge for NATO to defend. These countries are already in NATO. They have the full Article 5 guarantee. But it is a real challenge to defend these countries as is. I have a uh, map here. This, now we're going to transition to why this could be issues in the future. This is a map, I have to admit, that I screenshotted from Twitter, so I can't vouch for the exact accuracy, but the rough image gives you an idea of what's going on. This is Russia, this orange color, and here you have the Baltics, and here you have Poland. And at present, you have to defend this without these regions being in NATO, and you have to uh, uh, defend this little corridor above all else. This is obviously very, very challenging. Once you have Sweden and Finland in, however, that makes this a much more masterable challenge. You have also the issue of uh, what's called A2AD, anti-access area denial. I, I try to avoid jargon, but basically A2AD is the notion that you define a bubble and make it clear to your enemy that if you try to move within that bubble, it will be life-threatening, if not life-ending to you, generally by precision-guided precision munitions and missiles. So you see here in uh, red, you see Russian A2AD bubbles, and you see one right here around Kaliningrad. And then you see the NATO A2AD bubbles. And of course, you've got the big exception here, these gray zones of uh, Finland and Sweden. Obviously, that would be one of the things to change right away around Gotland Island and so forth. So once you put Finland and Sweden into NATO, suddenly the Baltic starts to look much more like a NATO lake, especially you've got the islands of the passage of Denmark here. I think in, in light of the fact that there are pre-existing commitments to the Baltics, I think it is really in our interest that Finland and Sweden become members absolutely as soon as possible. Of course, there are going to be new risks. The border with NATO and Russia will more than double. Uh, you see this very subtle thing that I also screenshotted from Twitter, old border, new border. I think you can even see that in the back. Uh, but the point is you're now going to have this new territory, and you are going to have new questions that will arise about where to balance your priorities. Will they be maritime? Will they be land-based? Uh, the Baltics obviously have very high expectations about uh, what Finland and Sweden coming in will be, what they will do for their defense. There will be internal issues. Uh, there already have been some. When I was researching my book on the 1990s, for example, I saw that uh, there was a lot of quiet behind the scenes communications between the Sw Swedes and the Finns with the Americans about the Baltics. And they went along the following lines. The Swedes and the Finns said to the Americans, you know, we live in a tricky neighborhood up here. And whatever we might feel, we all need to have business-like relations with the Russians. And the Baltics are really pushing hell for leather to get into NATO, and that might not be the best idea. It might not be in their own interest long term. Maybe we should talk to the Baltics. And when this is presented to Baltic leaders, they say, hell no, you guys think you understand Russia, right? Because you've lived up here. We really understand Russia. We're the captive nations. We were forced to be uh, forced into the Soviet Union. Uh, we know how to deal with Moscow. We want Article 5 and all the bells and whistles yesterday. None of this nonsense about self-restraint or Norway-style conditions. And so there was a lot of uh, gnashing of teeth and worry in Sweden and Finland back then. So it'll be interesting to see going forward discussions, whether discussions about a Scandinavian strategy, in other words, a self-restraint, whether that will be possible, whether Finland and Sweden will want that, what the what Baltics will think about that. I, I don't know what the answer to this is. That is the province of people like uh, General Mayor Wikman, who's going to be talking to us afterwards. We have the honor of the presence of a Swedish officer here. Uh, but I do want to signal that there are precedents in history for having thought about this issue, and there are precedents for having thought about this issue in this region. And so I think this is another case where it's important to look to history to help inform our decision making about this time period. So thank you for your attention. Thank you. Sure. So what, what are the implications of, of the Baltic Sea becoming a NATO lake? Well, are you asking me the question as a Russian or as a Swede or as an American? <laughs> Cui bono? <laughs> as a guest at Engelsberg. <laughs> The, um, the, uh, I think, obviously, as I said, uh, given that, obviously, there are, on the one hand, you're picking up this huge new land border, so mm -hmm. obviously that's a challenge. As I said, the NATO border with Russia will more than double. But given that there is the pre-existing Article 5 commitment to the Baltics, 
this is going to be very, very fortunate for that commitment. As you can see, you know, you, you, in order to get into the Baltics, you have to navigate through here. And if this is all NATO territory, which it's going to be since Norway and Denmark are already in, that is very fortunate for NATO and very unfortunate for Moscow. That, however, has the knock-on consequence that you do need to think about Moscow's reactions, right? Mm -hmm. So this is why I thought that was a wise strategy in 1949 on the part of Norway to think about the, the political responses, since obviously we've seen the man in the Kremlin will lash out even in ways that are self-harming. So as this happens, it's important to keep that in mind. That is, by the way, what is dangerous about the Turkish demands now. I don't think Turkey, as I said, will stop Finland and Sweden from becoming members of NATO, but they are extending this interim period, mm -hmm. which is tricky and dangerous and can give Russia time to think about ways to respond in that area. But Finland has for a long time been able to defend its own border mm -hmm. without the help of NATO. Is the change greater for Sweden, its new role as a NATO member, if it happens? Well, Finland obviously is thinking about adding a nuclear component. And as you heard from Charlie's wise comments, that's something that it wants to outsource, right? It wants to be a part of NATO's nuclear umbrella, not a nuclear power in its own right. So I think, I wouldn't say that Finland is sort of sorted and, you know, baked. Uh, so I think there's going to be a lot of changes in Finland as well. So I would say that there's, there's challenges of different kinds for both countries would be my answer. This far, thank you very much. Excellent, thank you so much. All right. Janne Roland Martlari, our next speaker. Thank you very much. Uh, since we have 15 minutes, I thought I would read out from this book that Rob <laughs> and I published uh, in 21, and it's called uh, Challenge for NATO Military Strategy in the 21st Century. Um, I will, however, try to relate my comments to the topic, which is liberty, freedom and ask whether NATO uh, promotes liberty uh, and whether it has the power to do so. So it's, it's, a, it's a question of virtue and of vertu, as we heard from uh, an, uh, the, the earlier speaker. Uh, and I think it's, uh, it's a very relevant question when it comes to the Ukraine case, which I will discuss a bit. Uh, so the question is, what kind of liberty uh, what does it mean in practical NATO politics and what role does NATO play now vis-a-vis um, -vis major states? And the preamble, you quoted from it, uh, they, the countries, the member states, this is the 49 Washington Treaty, are determined to safeguard the freedom, common heritage and civilization of their peoples founded on the principles of democracy individual liberty and the rule of law. So here we have it. This is the whole package, so to speak, uh, perfectly worded. It's all in there. Then in the same treaty, which I tell my students is a good read because it's a very short treaty, hasn't been changed since 49. So it's unlike the EU treaties. It's uh, readable for non-lawyers, as the lawyers often call us. Uh, Article 3 is on your own defence obligation. So Sweden and Finland, uh, you have to uh, be good at defending yourself. God helps those who help themselves. Uh, Article 4 is on the right of consultation if you feel threatened, your territorial integrity and sovereignty. Sovereignty then, of course, being a, a key uh, aspect, the key aspect of freedom. Uh, so this is what Turkey invokes all the time. It feels threatened by the Kurds and uh, a number of others, not the Russians, presumably. Then the famous Article 5, which uh, really doesn't say one has to rush to the defense of others, but says one will consult uh, in the case of an attack and have this one for all, etc. But uh, who will be the, the ones defending whom? That is, uh, in a way, a rather open question. Uh, then Article 10, open door policy, and this is the enlargement, sometimes called expansion, not politically correct perhaps, but the enlargement paragraph. And that says that states that can support the principles of the treaty can uh, apply to join. And let's look then uh, a little at how this has been practiced and how this may play out regarding Ukraine. One could say there are two two hypotheses then uh, in, in a broad way. Democracies may join NATO. 
Uh, so it's all about the values. Are you a, if you're a democracy, you may apply and join NATO if you are in the Euro-Atlantic uh, geographical area. Uh, and then we could say Turkey joined in 52. That was for... Uh, that was a promising and large Muslim democracy. Eastern Europe joined once they were democratic. Well, they could hardly join before. They were members of the Warsaw Pact. Spain, after Franco, offered to Ukraine and Georgia in 2008, um, was seemed to be a very naive offer based on no calculation of strategic interaction or reaction. So that would seem to validate a democracy thesis that if you... Uh, if you're interested and you are at least nominally a democracy, you may, you may apply. Uh, but of course, this democracy's joint thesis meets immediately realpolitik and reality in, in this uh, kind of uh, American phrasing, the checks that bounce. So the check to Georgia and Ukraine from 2008, uh, they were very generous. There was very little uh, sort of stipulation uh, when it was sort of come and join us as quickly as you want. And this was pushed by Washington, by Bush, to the, um, to the processations of the French and uh, Norwegians and others. We were quite skeptical. These were checks that bounced, as we know, because the Russians reacted in Georgia and they uh, later reacted in, in Ukraine. So if we say the other hypothesis, realpolitik, decides. NATO is a traditional military alliance. It seeks to expand when the enemy or threat, uh, the presumed threat, Russia is weak. So it expands in the, uh, in the 1990s, expands in the Balkans, uh, despite the opposition or attempt by the FSB to, to stall it, North Macedonia, Montenegro, maybe Bosnia, and you saw on the map, it would make good sense to have all of the Balkans as members. Uh, there is a strategy behind this. Uh, it is not only a plan, an open door policy, but there is a calculation behind it. Uh, does, is this borne out by the facts? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, there is, in a way, there was no concerted strategy behind enlargements um, that I have been able to find. And there was also um, this sort of partnership policy that was forged after 1990, which doesn't stipulate, uh, doesn't sort of invite a strategic consideration of who can become partners and whether this is a quick way to membership. The partnership policy, we wrote a study in 2011, a book called NATO, The Power of Partnerships, and it could have been the impotence of partnerships. But that may have served, paradoxically, NATO well, because when it comes to Ukraine, we see that um, indeed there's a partnership, that's NATO's relation with Ukraine for the moment. Nobody can say what exactly a partnership should entail. Uh, the partnership with um, Ukraine was on a low sort of back, back burner. It wasn't developed very, very much. I have a daughter who is in the Norwegian NATO delegation. She used to go to Ukraine to have these small projects to keep up the partnership, but nothing that was lethal, nothing that was threatening, not, nothing that could infuriate Russia. And this, as we know, was the policy regarding Ukraine until the present. It was a sort of, this is not our war, this is a partner country. Uh, the sanctions that came in place, they were EU, but they were primarily uh, US induced sanctions. Uh, and here we get to the leadership question, what moves NATO? And this is, of course, uh, sort of a, a lecture, particularly for the Finns and the Swedes, but you know all this already, of course, that look at the, the, the leadership uh, in NATO is American. And there was a story of a Norwegian NATO ambassador sitting between the American and the British. Uh, and the Belgian ambassador had opinions on everything in NATO and took the floor constantly, whereupon the American leans over in front of the Norwegian speaking to the Brit and he says, so what do they contribute? So it is a question of power, military willingness, ab ability, willingness and strategic interests. And very, very quickly, in the interest of time, NATO leadership, uh, American leadership brought NATO into being uh, the lead actor in Libya, the Libya uh, operation, 2011. 
The same is true in Afghanistan. We were all in enduring freedom, an American-led operation, and NATO needed a role. So here we had ISAF. Uh, then uh, also examples like... Um, like um, the, the sanctions I mentioned and other, uh, other cases of out-of-area operations, it's basically the US and allies. And we see the same now uh, in terms of NATO's role in Ukraine and strategic leadership. NATO's role is, in a, bit, is a bit unclear. We have Jens, my compa compatriot, uh, who is extremely active on the verbal political side. He is sort of talking up the NATO role tremendously. At the same time, he is stating that NATO has no formal part in uh, supplying arms, of course. But uh, uh, the, this active role of NATO, which, of course, related to the value questions, uh, must be one must condemn the ad bellum violation of the UN pact. One must condemn the uh, breaches of the Geneva Conventions. All of that is perfectly within the Treaty of NATO and should be. Uh, but we see that those that took the lead on what to do now, uh, they were um, the Americans seconded by the British and then seconded in turn by the Poles, the Baltics, the Nordics. And now we have a coalition of about 40 states, including Sweden, Finland, other non-NATO members. So here we have a very good illustration of how the action that goes on with or without the NATO chapeau, with or without the EU chapeau, uh, is really to be found in the major capitals with a military structure or military culture, strategic culture. Uh, and I think this is now important for predicting a bit what will happen in the Ukraine case. Uh, let's hope that NATO is not drawn into this inadvertently by a spillover. Uh, but I think NATO's role will be emerging, perhaps not as we think. Uh, if we just imagine the outcomes to come, uh, what we can predict now from what we know, um, there is a military prediction of a culmination point, as Clausewitz called it, late August perhaps, where Russia will not be able to fight anymore, won't have the ammunition, won't have the, uh, the, the troops, won't have the resources, and as we know from World War II, the Americans <laughs> won by having the resources, I mean the ability to produce, to transport, to supply. If we take this uh, view, if we believe this, we will be in a situation of a victor's justice, perhaps, with uh, the situation of uh, Colin Powell's uh, pottery barn rule rewritten. When you break it, you own it. When Russia breaks it, we own it. So somebody will have to pay uh, the reconstruction. And if there is uh, a military victory, of course, uh, the victors will not just so, sort of shake off the dust and go home. They will say, now we will have influence in this area and what better way of having long-term influence than making Ukraine a uh, candidate for membership, quick path, uh, fast track to NATO membership, EU membership. In all events, this will require uh, American security guarantees for Ukraine. The other alternative outcome is a status quo ante, uh, maybe plus something so that uh, there will be, uh, in a way, a Russian presen presence in Crimea and, this, and, the, and Donbass, Luhansk. But also in that case, be it a negotiated or non-negotiated outcome, there will be the same situation for the West. One will have to have a security guarantee. And again, uh, depending on the relative military power in the future between Russia and the West in Ukraine, so to speak, NATO membership uh, uh, will be uh, a likely option or one could simply have a perennial partnership policy on the part of NATO in Ukraine and just fill it with whatever one wants. And then finally, before... Uh, time flies, as Ronald Reagan said when he was president. He said, time flies when you're having fun. He said, not when it flies. What will be the counter move by Russia to this? Because now I've, I've outlined two scenarios that we, uh, we may see from our side. But of course, strategy is not a plan, as Mike Tyson underlined. He said, when you're punched in the face, you need a strategy. It's not enough to have a plan. So if Russia then... Finds, uh, finds it opportune, opportune to declare 
ceasefire in August, say, at some point where the culmination is approaching, uh, one could have then a great relief among Europeans, French, German, uh, Italian, uh, those that are not very keen on, uh, on going on with the war fighting, with the aid to Ukraine, so to speak, and one could have then perhaps a split among Western allies. Uh, so this will be, I think, a very smart way of, of thinking uh, Clausewitzian logic that all war is about political outcomes. Uh, and that would be uh, very much of the same situation continuing. Uh, as uh, one friend said, it will be deja vu all over again. Uh, you showed us that NATO had a lack of strategy, as you phrased it. Do you think this will be changing when NATO is, is facing the grim reality of a war in Europe? There is now a very strong public opinion when one sees, as I think Charlie said, when, when, when ordinary people see on TV and in the media how uh, mechanized uh, warfare actually plays out. And in addition, the terrible attacks on civilians is sort of the full spectrum of war crimes on display all the time. Uh, and this will make it, this has made it impossible to normalize a relationship with this president of Russia, mm. uh, certainly. Uh, and what I thought was uh, very unwise by President Biden at an earlier point where he said that uh, we can't talk with him, he, ha he has to leave, uh, he is a war criminal and so on. Don't demonize your opponent when you are colleagues in world politics. Mm. Now that is unavoidable. This, uh, th there can't be really this kind of uh, reset again. Um, but I don't. I think that from the Russian point of view, it's very wise to make this a long-drawn affair because the interest, the Western media will not be interested in, in, a, in a dull war that is low-key, that doesn't really bring big shocks. Politicians will lose interest. Uh, and uh, what then happens in Washington in the longer run? So I've seen many of these sort of extreme interests in Afghanistan, in Libya and so on. Everybody talks about it. And then after a while, the, the interest is gone. Mm, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> General Jonas Wikman is here in the capacity of Deputy Commander at Joint Forces Command of the Swedish Armed Forces. Please. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, so 106 days ago was the uh, Russian uh, large-scale invasion of Ukraine. A fundamental change to the security situation in our neighborhood, and we find ourselves, and I agree with that, in the most dangerous situation that we've been in, at least since the Second World War. Finland and Sweden has applied for a NATO membership, and that is a membership that will most definitely strengthen our capability to defend Sweden and Finland against an arm attack. But it's also a membership that will strengthen NATO's defense, and we'll be, we have been touching upon that, uh, and its current member states' capability to defend uh, for the short and long terms. So. Uh, Dear Foundation, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, it's an honor to be here and, and talk to you today. Uh, it's a really impressive uh, gathering of people and of thoughts. Makes me a little bit pressured. I don't know if you realized who you have invited. <laughs> you have invited a, a fighter pilot on an operational level in the armed forces. <laughs> so you have to follow me from the theoretical level through the political level down to the political tools level. That's how I work. So I'm, I'm the deputy uh, commander uh, of the Joint Forces Command. Uh, so, and the, uh, the commander of the Joint Forces Command or the uh, commander of Joint Operations, uh, uh, different title on it, is directly subordinate to, uh, to the Supreme Commander and uh, responsible for running all armed forces operations abroad and uh, nationally. So my task is a uh, day-to-day task uh, to try to, to uh, fulfill uh, the, the orders from our Supreme Commander, 
to keep our territorial integrity and run operations and defend our country. So that's my mission, and I will give you a few thoughts uh, from, from Sweden, starting uh, with Ukraine. Uh, I just put a map up there, it's not going to be a slideshow. I like maps. <laughs> a few maps before had Sweden cut in half. <laughs> Don't know why. So I brought this new map, uh, I think uh, that's, uh, 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 when you try to look at, at me, you can look at the map, and I think it it's, uh, says a lot, the map says a lot, so I like maps. Uh, so, uh, starting February 24th again, uh, a really dark chapter for, for us, unprovoked Russian uh, uh, invasion of Ukraine, and the return of large-scale warfare to, uh, to Europe. Uh, we have all seen and we have talked about that, you know, we all see the suffering and death uh, that, that, uh, that comes with it. So, and for us that has shown the Russians, uh, uh, Russian view of smaller uh, nations and smaller nations' sovereignty. It has also shown a very low and for us, a unpredicted low threshold for using all of its tools to reach the strategic goals. Uh, for us, the situation is very uh, uncertain and unpredictable. We think that Russia's ambition was to strike quickly, subdue the political leadership of Ukraine, and then move on to the next phase in a strategy, whatever that is. Uh, I think you and me both, we, we realized that Russia met a harder resistance than they expected. The Ukrainian people and its uh, military and political leadership has shown great uh, will and great courage uh, to defend their rights and their nation. Unfortunately, we know that uh, Russia don't give up on their strategic goals so easily. Russia wish, wishes to replace current European security order and replace it with an older version of it. A version that includes Russian spheres of interest. We have been talking about that earlier in the, in the, in the seminar. With buffer states uh, deprived of their right to make their own choices when it comes to foreign and security uh, policy. And therefore, therefore, in our mind, Russia is sending more troops to Ukraine. And the war will continue, months or years. Russia seems to believe that time is on their side. This must not happen. Uh, Russia thinks that the Western unity will fail sooner or later. We must not let that happen. A little bit about our history, uh, pre-NATO history. Uh, um, uh, the situ security situation for us in the, in the Baltic Sea and the, in, the Europe in Europe has changed uh, uh, for the worse for a few years now. And, and we have continued to try, uh, from a Swedish perspective and from an operational perspective, to adapt to this. Uh, and our current operational and strategic doc doctrine states that we plan to fight our wars or defend our country together with others. Our plans, all our military plans, all our war plans are dependent on cooperation and support from others. So our military strategic concept is to fight the war until help arrives and win the war together with partners, or avoid to lose without partners. So what I'm saying is that the international cooperation and uh, taking the fight together with partners is already a part of our strategic and operational uh, doctrine. So cooperation and partnerships are core principles in everything we do. We have been an active partner in NATO for many years now, and we have conducted exercises and operations uh, together. Uh, we are very ambitious in our cooperations, and in some areas, like typical Swedes, 
we are more integrated to NATO and more NATO adapted than most NATO uh, membership states. But that's just the Swedish way to do it. <laughs> we need to be best in the class, if that now is an uh, English expression. Also, in parallel to our NATO membership, we have more than 20 bilateral defense agreements with other states. And that was pre-February. That is our strategy to, to keep our nation safe. So, although a lot have happened in the last three months, including our national security policy changing rapidly and fundamentally, the Swedish NATO applications, at the same time, from a military level, is somewhat of a natural next step. Our assessment right now is that the threat to Sweden, like I said, is at the highest level that it's been for a very long time, at least since the Second World War. And this affects everything we do. And trust me, the knowledge of the dangerous situation we are in right now affects everything we do in the armed forces. It, it affects the atmosphere, it, it affects the pace, it affects everything, even vacation plans, which is a big thing for, for a Swede. <laughs> so the, uh, the higher threat in Sweden right now is due to a few factors. I just want to mention uh, four of them. First of all, Sweden has, from the beginning, been a very solid and been part of the very solid and united response from, from EU and from NATO. Secondly, we have provided substantial support directly to, to the Ukrainian armed forces, and more is on the way. And thirdly, maybe a little bit other aspect of it, an attack on Sweden right now, or on Finland for that, for that matter, would be an attack on the Western unity, on a Western alliance from a Russian perspective, without triggering Article 5. So that is the situation we have put ourselves in when we applied for NATO membership. So we are in a situation from, from uh, really from, from when the Russians um, perceived that we were going to apply for membership until we have Article 5. That's very da dangerous uh, for Sweden in many ways. And lastly, of course, uh, the membership application itself. So, and, and, and this has been said before, uh, the, our decision to apply for NATO membership runs counter to to uh, what was mentioned in, in this panel, uh, to the security demands put forward by uh, Russia on December 21. It runs counter to Russian views on how countries within what they consider the sphere of interest, how they should act. In, the, in light of these uh, factors, we cannot include some, exclude some kind of actions or reaction from the Russian side against Sweden and directly or indirectly. Actions uh, to influence uh, Sweden's Swedish decision-making, actions to influence the position Sweden is in, is in, thereby affecting other NATO membership countries' uh, decision process, or actions uh, directly, dir uh, directed directly to other uh, NATO membership countries and their decision process uh, running up for a, a membership for us. Possible action could include cyber attacks, uh, discrediting decision makers, disinformation campaigns, and incursions, etc. Also, I just have to mention that we do not exclude, however unlikely, an armed attack uh, towards Sweden. Naturally, uh, this is an intense period for the Swedish armed forces and for me. Um, some of our military measures are very, and our operations in our response is very visible, uh, and that's intentionally. Uh, many of you have seen our operations going on on Gotland, strengthening the, the defense on Gotland uh, uh, this Christmas and, uh, and this spring, and uh, some other exercises we have done with, uh, with the partners, Finland and with other partners. Uh, we have also a lot of other measures that have not been made public. 
As we speak, the level of redness is uh, very high and we have taken extensive actions to monitor the situation, minimize our weaknesses and to prepare our actions. In this regard, an increased uh, cooperation with other agencies in Sweden, which can be tricky with the construction we have, such as the police and the Coast Guard and other agencies involved in the defense of, uh, uh, um, in Sweden are central. Maintaining a high degree of situation, uh, under situation awareness and maybe most important, the understanding of the situation is key. We do this uh, using our own sensors, our own operations, but maybe more important and not at least through an intense dialogue with partners. The dialogue with other operational headquarters has been intensified. I personally talked to my counterparts in most uh, NATO countries on a regular level. So the, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, cooperation has really in been intensified the last uh, few months. Among our partners, uh, the cooperation with Finland is uh, always particularly intense uh, given the depth of our cooperation. The dialogue and information change with other countries and organizations very active as well, uh, as well. not least uh, the other Nordic countries, the US, the UK and NATO headquarters. So I just want to uh, end up with uh, mentioning, of course, that the great support we have gotten from other countries during this uh, period of time. Uh, many nations have uh, realized the situation we and Finland are in, and they have pledged to stand by our side should anything happen to us. This is uh, very generous. It uh, reflects true solidarity, and I also think it reflects a genuine belief that the Swedish and Finnish membership will benefit the alliance. We will contribute to the Alliance. We will not only bring the table the highest strategic territory, but also well-equipped and trained armed forces representing mo modern military thinking and ca capability. I also think, and we've been talking about that, and maybe we'll come back to that in questions, that the Scandinavian countries, uh, and Sweden and Finland uh, joining NATO, will form a uh, whole picture in the Scandinavian Peninsula and in the Baltic Sea that will be the start of a platform for a strong defense of the Baltic Sea region and the high north. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is the end of my brief and I've tried to highlight the importance of cooperation, uh, the importance of common situation awareness in this situation, which for us is a very, it's a, I, I don't want to use extra words on it, but it's, it's, a, it's a special and dangerous situation that we are in. We are stronger together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jonas. What is the big challenge for the armed forces when you go from partnership to membership in NATO? I think, um, I think for the armed forces, it's, it's, it's not a big leap. It's, not, it's, it's a quite uh, short step. Our, our, um, uh, it's, it's, I just want to put the question the other way around. It, it, it's going to enable uh, things that are hard to do today. Hmm. Today, uh, we don't have the possibility to align our plans good enough. We don't have the possibility to be part of NATO planning. Uh, we can observe NATO planning, uh, we can plan accordingly, but we cannot affect NATO planning. But we intend to, to fight together, so that, that will be enabled. The most, it's going to be e easy, it's going to be more... Um, I mean, one of the trickiest part is that we will you know, in a few months after we get the membership, uh, have to send uh, like 150 officers to NATO headquarters and stuff. 150 officers is a lot for Sweden. And mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's going to be the, you know, the tricky part. But operational wise and defense plans is going to just enable, uh, enable operations. And also you're going from being basically a training peacetime organization to be an operational organization. In Sweden? Yes. Uh, 
So, so you're talking to the head of the operational part of the... Yeah, uh, but, of, but behind, of, you, of behind you, you have a big, <laughs> only a big school system. That's true, but we, we are very much in operational yeah. uh, okay. forces. No, I, I, wanna, I no, but, uh, no that, that, that's true. I mean, we're going to get... Um, no, I, I think, uh, I mean, I, I think uh, the question... It's not going to change very much. Okay. I mean, this is the answer to the question. Are we going to be as operational? Yeah. Uh, I think the... It's going to be more or more of NATO exercises. More of a, it's going to affect the training part more than the operational part. Mm. Will we need these twenty bilateral agreements as NATO members? Uh, I think we are not in the need, the same kind of need, because that was a way for us to to make sure that we have uh, a high. I mean, that was. In, in part instead of an Article 5. But the uh, bilateral agreement is an agreement of deeper co uh, cooperation, and bilateral cooperation will be as important in the future.